Hi, physics students, and welcome to a video for the topic 9.4, which is, which is resolution. Um, I'm going to talk in this video about something called the Rayleigh criterion, and we're going to talk about um, diffraction gratings again, and then applications of this concept called resolution. Now, you're probably um, familiar with the term resolution. Uh, we use that word in um, everyday English to mean lots of different things. Um, in the context of physics, we're using the term resolution when we can basically just differentiate between two distant uh, light sources. Okay, um, You know that, for example, if you're looking um, at car headlights coming towards you at night, when, it, when a car is very, very far away, okay, uh, you can't differentiate between the two headlights. It just looks like one big blob of light. As it gets closer, in fact, when it gets to a particular distance from you, only then can you discern the actual two, the fact that it's actually two different lights shining instead of one big one, okay? Um, this means, actually, that they're very close in angle, of course. this In this case, theta is very small, of course, so this is obviously related to the previous topics we've been recently um, talking about. Now, if the eye or any other optical device such as a camera or a telescope can tell the two sources apart we say that these are now resolved okay and the reason why we actually uh, don't see them resolved as two images initially when they're far away is because of diffraction patterns okay so what happens is that um, you know when light is diffracted through uh, or passes through a circular aperture there's a diffraction pattern if the maxima of those diffraction patterns overlap one another you get kind of a blurry image like this where it's kind of all messy and you can't actually physically tell that the two things are separate objects okay all right if they're separated by a little more you get this only when they're completely separated and there's a minimum between them would you actually see or would the camera detect two specific um, objects instead of one okay so that's what we're going to talk about in this in this video okay if you recall the conditions for the minima observed from a single slit diffraction we had that theta equals lambda over b and remember b was the slit width okay and we had a pattern like this that matched this intensity versus theta uh, against theta graph okay for circular apertures there's a slightly different version of this there's a factor of 1.22 that goes in front of the lambda over b and this 1.22 is a result of um, actually using a calculus based derivation of this equation of course you don't you do not have to derive this um, but it has to do with the average width or the average opening. Think of the diameter as the opening of a circular aperture as being 1.22 over B. Okay. Uh, anyway, again, don't worry about deriving it, but you're going to be using this equation quite a bit. Okay. Now, this thing called the Rayleigh criterion, what it means is that two points, like light can be light or two objects or whatever, are what, what we call just resolved when the first dark fringe and the diffraction pattern of one falls directly on the central bright fringe and the diffraction pattern of the other. Now what this looks, looks like in my intensity against angle graph is like this, okay? If they're just resolved, that is to say, if we can tell them apart, discern them as two different, distinctly different objects, okay? The first maximum or the first dark fringe of one of them right here lines up. You see how this lines up just perfectly with the central bright fringe and the other, okay? In this case over here, they are unresolved, so this would be kind of blurry, um, like a bigger sort of blob like what we saw before in the previous slide, okay? All right, and in 3D, this is what it looks like here, object one, object two, the minimum theta, okay? So you can tell that um, if we want to increase the resolving power of a camera or an eyeball or whatever, what we want is we want for theta to be very, very small. We don't want a very, very big theta. We want it to be super tiny so we can discern or resolve very, very, very small objects. That's what we're looking for, okay? Now, this is related to the idea of resolution of images. I know that you guys, you know, you have your phones and, and they have a certain, uh, the camera has a certain pixel rating and so forth resolution. Generally, the higher the resolution of something, the sharper or clearer the image, okay? This is related to the idea of resolution of images. This is a certain object that's one by one pixel, two by two, five by five, 10 by 10, 20 by 20, 50, 50, 100. And you can tell that really it isn't until you get to about 10 pixels by 10 pixels that you can actually figure out what this object is, okay? Now, I'm gonna come up with an equation for resolution for you guys. Now, 
If you remember, for light going through a single slit, if theta was really small, we said that sine theta equals theta amp in radians. So um, we have these two situations here, lambda over b again, and 1.22 lambda over b. In the IB, we're going to actually equate both of these. They're in no approximately equal to. Two objects can just be resolved if their angular separation is greater than this above, okay? Now, remember, when using radians, what we do is we make a diagram here where we have the big D being the distance between the objects and the actual slits or the actual camera or eyeball. Um, and then X would be here. Theta is here as usual, okay? For small angles where N equals 1, we're going to treat distance as a straight line. And high resolving power means the smallest possible possible theta. We're looking for a very small angle. That's the whole point here, okay? Now, in reality, how we're going to solve these problems, right? We're going to equate x over d equals to 1.22 lambda over b. That's what we're going to do, okay? And I'll do a couple of examples for you, like this one. The camera of a spy satellite orbiting 200 kilometers has a diameter of 35 centimeters. What's the smallest distance this camera can resolve on the surface of the Earth? And we assume an average wavelength of 500 nanometers, okay? First thing I always do is I draw myself a picture. Okay, so you can see here on the surface of the Earth, um, I have, I have here, I have these two objects, um, these two things separated by this distance x right here. You can see that x in this case is actually half the distance that separates the objects. Here's d. This should really be a big d, I guess, to keep in line with what we did before. Okay, so here we go. 1.22 lambda over b equals x over d. All I do is I solve for x, and then I note that. Again, I want to double x to 70 centimeters, okay? So that means, this is quite amazing, a satellite that has a lens of diameter 35 centimeters orbiting 200 kilometers can resolve, if I have two things that are 70 centimeters apart, it can actually, from that distance, tell that I have two separate objects in its image. It's quite remarkable, actually, okay? Try this one. The headlights of a car are two meters apart. The pupil of the human eye has a diameter of about two millimeters. What's the maximum distance at which the two headlights are seen distinct or just resolved by a person? Again, here's, it, here's, here's my diagram. This, again, should really be big D. I'm going to change that here for you guys. Okay. All right. And then I just apply the equation. I just apply the equation. Here, I'm solving for D. I'm solving for big D, which is Bx over 1.22 lambda. And I get about three kilometers. Okay. All right, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, diffraction gratings, okay? So diffraction gratings, remember that's a large number of parallel grooves or slits with negligible width. And we said before that the more slits that a diffraction grating has or the more rulings or the more um, lines, the sharper or brighter the pattern, the first thing. The other is that the more even the intensities of the fringes, okay? So the greater number of slits enables diffraction gratings to resolve um, two lines in a spectrum where we have wavelengths that are super close together. And this has very important practical uh, uses in science. Now, because the wavelengths are very close to one another, the angles at which the lines will be observed will be very close, of course, since for constructive interference, we have that n lambda equals d sine theta, okay? Now, if the angular separation um, between two lines is too small, obviously the, the lines can't be resolved. And when I'm talking about two lines, I'm talking about two lines right here, right? Remember, this is the intensity against angle um, plot, all right? Okay, so the resolving power of a diffraction grating is given by the ratio of the average wavelength to the change in wavelength between two, two different waves, okay? And it's called R. Now, M is what's called the order at which the lines are observed. Just think of it, re remember, as different multiples of... Um, uh, lambda or the angle as it fans out on either side. Capital N is the total number of slits or rulings. Okay, so therefore, if we want to determine the smallest difference in wavelengths, which is a very common question that can be resolved by a diffraction grading, what we do is we just rearrange this equation right here and we solve for delta lambda. Okay, and again, a common kind of question to be asked. A smaller uh, wavelength, a smaller difference in wavelengths means usually that um, more rulings are necessary on the grading or a higher, a higher um, rating for the lines, okay? Like in this example, a beam of light containing different wavelengths, it's incident on a diffraction grading, 600 lines per millimeter and 2 centimeters wide. The average wavelength of the beam is 620. Calculate the least difference in wavelength that can possibly be resolved by this grading in the second order. Okay, now this means that m equals 2. Okay, now since the grating is 2 centimeters wide and has 600 lines per millimeter, it has a total of 12,000 rulings or lines. So since we're using second order, m equals 2, and all I do is I again solve for delta lambda, and I got that, wow, it's a very small um, 
very, very, very small, right? Um, 0 0.0258 nanometers. Okay, it's very small delta, delta lambda. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about uses and applications of uh, resolution, okay? Number one, telescopes and cameras. We've obviously talked about cameras before. Uh, we just did an example with that. So when a lens forms an image of a small object, it obviously acts as a circular aperture, and the image is really a diffraction pattern, okay? So we use this version of the equation, of course, 1.22 lambda over b. b is the diameter of the lens. The resolving power can obviously be improved by, um, by increase, and when I say improved, remember I'm talking about lowering theta. I can lower theta by doing one of two things. I can make b bigger, so I can actually increase the size of the, of the lens. That's why you see uh, some of these cameras with these huge gigantic lenses, okay? Um, or what I can do is I can decrease the wavelength of light, which of course increases the frequency, okay? Um, so some microscopes obtain even a greater resolution by using ultraviolet radiation, therefore increase or decreasing lambda, which would increase the frequency, okay? Okay, electron microscopes, these are really cool, all right? It uses an electron beam to illuminate an object and produce a magnified image. It, it's got a greater, greater resolving power because electrons have wavelengths, and this is into going into quantum physics a little bit. It turns out that they're particles, but they also have wavelengths, and they're about 100,000 times shorter than visible light photons, okay? And they have super high frequencies, and, and uh, you can actually resolve extremely small objects like all of these details on a fly's head. That's pretty gross, but really, really cool. Okay, radio telescopes, really, really excellent uh, application, okay? So radio telescopes use, uh, use waves in the radio part of the spectrum, okay? And um, I mean, specifically what they do is they map sources of radio waves, okay, arriving at the Earth from the solar system. We'll study this a little more when we talk about astrophysics, okay? The radio telescope is made up of an aerial in the form of a, of a parabolic metal surface, okay? And it can be rotated to face any point in the sky. So distant radio waves are, are reflected towards the focus from all parts of the dish, and the converting wa waves are then passed to a sensitive receiver. So larger telescopes can provide greater resolving power, so that the size of the telescope actually equates to lowercase b in the equation before. But it's too expensive to build these, right? But what you can do is you can... Um, you can make arrays, right? So you can make arrays of telescopes, which are just a great number of telescopes over a large area. And what they can do is they can actually artificially make B really, really big by using lots of different telescopes over a huge, huge area, okay? All right, CDs and DVDs. Talked a little bit about diffraction pattern, like the rainbow pattern on a CD when light reflects off of it, okay? So... We'll talk about this more later, but the tracks on a CD carry information which are um, in what we call pits. So there's a series of grooves like pits and what, what they call pits and lands, okay? The pits reflect less well than the, inter and than the intertrack regions because of interference. The pit depth is close to one quarter the wavelength of the laser light used in the pickup. And so what happens is you have a, a greater wave, a greater path length for the reflected light from the bottom of the pit than you do the land, and there's, a, there's an interference pattern, okay? Um, but the point is, in the context of this lecture, is that it's important that the reflected light uh, coming off each track can be resolved. So this is a limit to how close together the tracks can be, right? This is why Blu-ray discs are typically better than the conventional DVD, because Blu-ray disc uses a blue laser beam, which has a higher frequency, okay? So it kind of all comes together that way.